Good morning. Good to see you. All right, it's 9:30. We have uh, two really great topics this morning: um, SEPs and and air monitoring, mobile monitoring, um, comparison values, among other things. So let's go ahead and call this work session of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to order. Today is. Do I, do I have to use the gavel? No, I, yeah, OK. <laughs> OK. But you, you have the opportunity to use the big workforce commission. Yeah, I don't see our gavel, gavel here. We don't, we, um, so. this, this setting is just way too formal for a work session. So that's, uh, that's what's kind of bugging me right now. Yeah. But anyway, um, what have I done? Um, June 27th, 2024, it's 9.31 a.m. All three commissioners are here. Our general counsel is here. Executive director staff is here. Um, so let's get it going. Mary, please call the first item. Our first item is the discussion of the TCQ's use and deployment of mobile monitoring instruments and the discussion of the derivation derivation and application of mobile monitoring comparison values for use by TCEQ staff for interpretation of mobile monitoring data. And we've we've got a bunch of people here from the ED staff to talk about these issues. Great, and I'm not sure who's starting, but I'll just go ahead and hand it off to Morning Craig, to Executive Director Staff. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel. I'm Craig Pritzloff, Director, Office of Compliance and Enforcement. And I'm pleased this morning to be here at this work session, even though I'm at a podium, so that's odd, but happy to be here discussing uh, TCQ's use and deployment of our mobile air monitoring uh, equipment. And when we say mobile monitoring equipment, that includes everything beyond our stationary air monitoring network. So it includes handheld monitoring equipment, as well as our mobile vehicles. And many thanks to the legislature for the appropriations which we've been given uh, for that mobile monitoring fleet. And this morning, I'm going to discuss each one of those pieces of equipment. And then this afternoon at one o'clock on the Park 35 campus between buildings B and C, we will have a show and tell uh, of our toy box, so to speak. We'll have our mobile monitoring vehicles out there as well as our handheld vehicles. So we'll have members of our mobile monitoring team available um, to show and display our mobile monitoring vehicles. And we'll have members of our Region 11 Austin staff uh, to talk about some of our handheld uh, air monitoring equipment. Uh, then after I discuss, um, kind of give you the overview of, of the equipment, Dr. Lang uh, and her toxicology group is going to talk about how we use the data that we collect from these mobile um, pieces of equipment because it's different from the data that we collect from our stationary air monitors. The stationary air monitors, uh, for the most part, are collecting continuous or, or even grab samples that are easy to, to distill down to uh, the 30-minute air comparison values, 24-hour, one-hour standards. But how do we uh, use these more instantaneous measurements when we're using the handheld equipment or the mobile monitoring vehicles those vehicles are collecting uh, air monitoring data in, in seconds. And so we may have seconds of data or a few minutes of data. And what does that mean and how do we use that data out in the field? Because this data is very important for screening and emergency response events, for doing additional investigation uh, looks and record, and record looks. Um, and so I dare say that TCQ, as always in the state of Texas, we are a pioneer and we are leading the way for others to follow. And we're doing that again, not only with the deployment, and I haven't fact-checked this, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, but I think we have one of the largest mobile monitoring fleets um, among regulatory agencies um, in North America. Um, someone can fact-check me on that, but I'm just gonna make the statement here on the record that I think we do. Um, so T Texas is leading the effort in, in terms of being out in the field and, and using this equipment um, for the benefit of the citizens of Texas and for our mission, which is every day protecting human health and the environment for all Texans. We've taken that a step further scientifically, and how do we use the data that we collect from this type of equipment? And how do we, 
how do we articulate that into health-based standards? And Dr. Lang is going to talk about um, that peer review um, uh, uh, standard that that we've set here at TCEQ. So very exciting work session. Thank you for for calling this today. Um, it's it's an easy easy talk to 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 give about all the great work that we're doing at TCEQ. And in terms of staff on this item, uh, I just want to recognize uh, Mr. Andy uh, 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 Gardner, uh, head of our program support and small business local government assistance group. Brandy Brooks, head of our air monitoring division. Cynthia Gandy, one of my special assistants, and Julie Eldridge, uh, deputy director of the air monitoring group here today. And we have additional staff that will be available at one o'clock this afternoon. Um, there'll be a whole other host of items or staff here for item two that they'll introduce later. So looking at the um, air monitoring capabilities, let me first talk about our air monitoring vehicles. It is on. One moment, please. Our air monitoring vehicles, there we go, uh, measure con uh, concentrations of chemicals while in transit. So uh, we have various pieces of equipment that we've retrofitted into vans and other vehicles. This is one uh, shown here on the screen, uh, typically what they look like. Our field vehicles will look a little bit different, a little bit smaller. Um, and these pr uh, provide uh, instantaneous uh, measurements of, of data of air, air quality uh, in those areas and can inform uh, the need for investigators to conduct further investigation at facilities uh, in those nearby areas or to inform uh, incident commanders uh, if we're responding during uh, emergency events. Hey, Craig, just to be clear, the photograph here shows the mobile monitoring van, but the trailer that it's pulling is not part of the van. It just happens to be pulling a, I imagine a generator or something like that. Is Am I correct about yeah, that? Yeah, that's a tow generator. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. So not part of the mobile monitoring equipment, but maybe we're dragging it out to support a stationary monitor. Yeah. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, and General Counsel. I'm Brandy Brooks, uh, for the record, Deputy Director of the Monitoring Division. And your, your assumption is correct. That's a tow generator, and it helps power the instruments that are in the van. Oh, okay, so it is it is integral. It to is critical the, to to the mobile to the van. monitoring. Okay, yes. I thought the van was a standalone unit without the generator. Okay, that's that's helpful. I appreciate it. We do have built-in generators, but as a backup, we often have the tow in place. Okay, so they can run without the without the tow generator, but just for additional backup. Or that's if you're going to be deployed for a longer longer period of time, you you add the the backup the tow the tow generator. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. I learned something. This is good. This is helpful. One of the uh, the important capabilities of these mobile monitoring vehicles is that we can cover greater greater length um, and geographic scope than we could with our handheld equipment because uh, we can transit, get real time data um, throughout neighborhoods. Uh, when I talk about handheld equipment, here's the typical handheld equipment that we use um, out in the field, and this is our base equipment that investigators will have on any kind of air investigation or emergency response capability involving air emissions. Uh, the ultra-ray and multi-ray capabilities uh, are able to detect volatile organic compounds. We have OGIC, optical gas imaging cameras, which can see what can't be seen. Uh, is a good screening tool to see if there's emissions uh, that, are, that are coming out of sources um, uh, that, that shouldn't be. And so that's often used as a screening tool for, for further investigation. We also have TVAs, toxic vapor anal analyzers, and if we need to, we can drop one of those canisters to collect um, uh, samples over a period of time and then send it off to our lab for analysis. But the, the OGIC, optical gas imaging camera, and the multi-rays uh, are able to collect data in that real-time uh, effort for us. Craig, I'm gonna drag us into the weeds thing. Um, Multi-ray and ultra-ray. One of is it the multi-ray that which one one speciates VOCs and one is incapable of speciating VOCs? It just gives a total VOC. Number yeah, total VOCs right? on the multi-ray, and it's the uh, the ultra-ray that can have those little canisters that we can attach in there and uh, specifically speciate for specific compounds such as benzene. And I don't have a full list of all the others, but benzene is is the most typical one that we can attach that little that little grab canister too. Okay, appreciate that. Not to get ahead of you, but is, have we been able to equip any um, 
any of these devices to our drone fleet yet. Uh, we are looking at that, but um, and there's certain uh, capabilities of, of unmanned area vehicles that can carry this type of equipment. Uh, they are uh, uh, highly um, expensive. Mm -hmm. And so right now we have 42 uh, unmanned aerial vehicles within our fleet that have cameras only, either thermal or high definition cameras. We don't have any right now that, that carry a capability to have a payload for air monitoring capabilities with OGIC or otherwise. Uh, we are continuing to look at that, um, but cost is 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 a factor uh, in that consideration. Bigger payload too, so it's gonna yeah. Right, gotcha. I'm gonna turn now into our uh, the types of equipment that are in our mobile vehicles. Uh, the DUBOS, the dual ultraviolet uh, absorption absorption spectrometer, DUBOS, uh, is a, a really fabulous piece of equipment. Uh, if you've seen the so-called caterpillar drawings, uh, that's a capability that this piece of equipment can can offer us in near real time, where we can transit and get that every four second piece of data uh, after we've calibrated. Uh, and the screen there is showing um, kind of kind of what that that display looks like. And we're looking at benzene, and we can color code that in a red light, green light type of fashion to to alert to alert uh, folks of, of where we're seeing exceedances. Uh, there's a limited suite of compounds that this piece of equipment can, can detect, but it's the most common type of volatile organic compounds, including the benzenes and the 1,3-butadienes uh, that can collect in that real-time data. Uh, we've got this, this piece of equipment on, on a, a one of our uh, vehicles in Austin and then in each of our uh, regional vehicles uh, that have been deployed out into the regions. Unfortunately, this piece of equipment uh, is um, the manufacturer has had supply chain issues post COVID and um, we're having issues with uh, continued support of this of this unit. So we're actively looking at what the future replacement for this unit might be. And we've actively gone through and, and scoured uh, where we could and bought up all the, the spare parts that we could buy um, uh, across the universe. And so we're stockpiling that and and hopefully the uh, the company will We'll find a, a, a way through this, but if not, we'll be ready to, to pivot as needed in the future. Uh, I just wanted to put that out on the record, though. And Craig, we've used this for past um, disaster response events. Um, can you talk at all about sort of the um, um, kind of the, the the time frame in terms of communicating monitored data to the public? So, for instance, if I if I see a TCQ van. Um, driving down my street and, and the DeBoss is working away and taking samples. I know there's a, a QAQC process for the data and there's probably some other manipulation we have to do with the graphics in order to present that. But based on our on our prior disaster response events, when might I expect that data to be up on a TCQ website? In a typical disaster, dis uh Emergency response scenario. Uh, we'll be reporting that through the incident command structure, and make sure all communications are routed through the incident command. First and foremost, we want to make sure the incident commander has the information at hand and can make immediate decisions in terms of emergency response capabilities and maximum protection of the public. So we'll be funneling that information immediately through incident command, and they they will funnel that out accordingly in terms of if we need, if the incident command needs to adjust with the local authorities, any exclusionary zones uh, or evacuation areas, or if those can be contracted. Uh, so we, we try and get that data out to them near real time uh, on the DUVOS. And that gets funneled out uh, to the local authorities and to the public uh, through that incident command structure. Appreciate that. Moving into the uh, the two vehicles we have in Austin, the the one vehicle that I showed you in the picture before, uh, with that tow trailer, uh, carries uh, uh, the select ion flow tube mass spectrometer, the SIFT unit. Uh, this is a near real time uh, 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 monitoring device, uh, but require it's unlike the Duvast, which can collect it while in transit. This one, usually we have to have it at a stationary location to collect data. 
But the advantage of this device, it carries um, the capability of monitoring for a, a much lar larger suite of, of volatile organic compounds uh, of over a thousand uh, compounds. Uh, within that, uh, we have uh, a narrow suite of compounds where we can get quantitative data uh, pretty readily, and then we can calibrate as well for, for additional compounds. Um, and then if we need to do, uh, say, in an emergency response scenario, we can move to, to qualitative measurements without calibration, you know, the, the presence or absence of a particular compound within a degree of, of, of I think it's a plus or minus 50% uh, uh, a range, so it's not quantitative, won't give us that specific data that we can rely upon, but it can tell us presence or absence of a compound, and then if we need to, we can calibrate to, to further refine for that data. So if if the DuVos is, is unavailable because of the suite of compounds that may be being released uh, from a facility or during an emergency response event, this unit can be deployed for a much more refined and discrete uh, capability. Same thing with the handhelds, as you noted. Uh, general VOCs, yes or no. Um, maybe with some discrete capabilities to, to narrow down with a canister on the ultra ray to benzene. This one will give us, you know, kind of a laboratory out in the field. Another piece of equipment that we deployed are nephilometers uh, onto some of our, our regional monitoring vehicles, as well as the the home fleet in Austin, uh, to to detect. Uh, for particulate matter uh, in response, and, and that's not for particulate matter and ambient concentrations, but in response to uh, a, a, a smoke event, an emergency response scenario. Uh, so is, is there a particulate matter of concern? Uh, so that's what that unit is, is used for. And then weather is a huge uh, capability uh, that we need to monitor for, because uh, one thing I, I, I do want to emphasize as well, yes, we have all of this sophisticated equipment, but certain weather conditions preclude use of that equipment. If it's raining, you can't monitor. Uh, if there's high winds, it may uh, in interact with and, and, and affect the capabilities of the units. If there's high humidity, it may affect the capability of some of these units. So just want to make sure everyone is, is mindful of, of, of the weather. Um, and, and the use of the Magellan system as well allows us to, uh, with wind patterns, uh, help us narrow down uh, where a source might be, uh, where where a source of compounds might be that we're detecting coming from based on on, on those wind patterns. Another piece of equipment that we have on some of our mobile units is the Picaro, which measures for hydrogen sulfide uh, concentrations, and uh, we'll have this on our on our unit being deployed into the Permian Basin. For those regional vehicles, uh, we also have it in our Austin vehicles. For those regional vehicles, uh, the the vehicles that we have, uh, based on recent funding, uh, we've outfitted uh, vehicles and placed them uh, in five different regional offices. We have the, uh, a, a Duvas vehicle, rapid transit vehicle, in the Corpus Christi region office, the Houston region office, Beaumont region office, Dallas region office, and uh, very soon the Midland region office as well. So exciting capabilities. These vehicles are used in, uh, in many types of scenarios. Emergency response, uh, if there's uh, an industrial disaster or a natural disaster that merits response capabilities. Uh, if, if critical infrastructure is being affected uh, during a natural disaster, uh, we'll deploy as soon as it is safe. Uh, in, in, in those areas where we, where we believe there may be uh, concerns uh, with, with industrial facilities impacted uh, by those natural disasters. We also deploy them um, uh, in, in ind industrial calamities as well. Uh, and we use them in, in follow-up for investigations. We get a complaint uh, of odors or, or other, other types of scenarios. We may deploy one of the regional vehicles uh, to assist in those investigations. Or if we're doing a focused investigation, we may deploy those vehicles in coordination with our handhelds um, and, and do, say, transits around a, a particular facility um, in coordination with a team um, on the on the ground. Uh, we've we've done this successfully over the last several years, uh, rotating what we call our fugitive focused and types of investigations, where we're we're looking for uh, for leaks and fugitive emissions on on facilities, and we usually deploy one of our regional vehicles. And maybe even a, a home vehicle 
uh, around the fence line perimeter of those facilities um, and coordinating uh, with our team on the ground. Uh, it's been very successful. Uh, the goals of those are one, to prevent emissions, reduce emissions, and uh, especially with leak, uh, uh, leak types of investigations and fugitive uh, investigations, uh, trying to prevent that next disaster. Because uh, if there's leaks, there's a high potential for something going wrong. We also do these, um, use these vehicles um, on regular surveys as well uh, in, in areas of, of high industrial activity. And um, have a map here pulling up. There it is. Uh, here's an example of, of some areas where we deploy in the Houston area on, on a regular basis. Uh, uh, monthly to quarterly, bi-monthly, as need arises, uh, we'll we'll send the vehicle out um, and 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 do transits uh, in, in these areas. Uh, you know, just looking for emissions, and if we see something of concern, uh, that's uh, usually a cause for further investigation. Um, and uh, here's an example of of a of a survey that we did uh, in the Channel View area, uh, where. Uh, it, Another example of, of a response that might be, say, if we have a stationary air monitor that's, that's detecting something of concern, we'll look at that and maybe deploy our, our, our regional assets with handheld equipment and, and, and the mobile surveys and, and, and look at fence line communities and try and do source identification and do further investigations of, of facilities of concern. That is all of the equipment um, in a nutshell. And uh, thank you for the time this morning. Again, at one o'clock, we'll have a further discussion of the technical capabilities uh, on the ground, let you, let you hold some of the equipment, play around, crawl around in those units. And if you have any further questions, let me know, or our staff, absent that, turn it over to Dr. Lang. Thank you, Craig, appreciate that. I think we have a, Katarina has a question. How often do you do these surveys? Depends on the regional area, but, mm -hmm. uh, when the Duvas was func when we knew the Duvas uh, was was fully operational, we were doing these about monthly to bi-weekly. With the Duvas having been taken off the unsupport list with the company in, in potential non-viability, we scaled back that to to preserve those units to extend their lifespan. So these these units are or these surveys are being run no less than uh, bi-monthly. So every two months, we, we try and run these surveys out in the field. And are, are you finding things when you do that? Uh, it, it, it depends. And if we do find some, we um, uh, will we'll be cause for further investigations or calls to facilities. Thank you. Bobby, any questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kirk, for the information. I'm, I'm curious for a little further information on one, one point you touched on. And you mentioned the conditions where our monitoring equipment unfortunately simply does not work as <clears throat> as designed and simply won't, won't gather data so we'll shut it down during periods of rainfall. I've seen criticism of our agency for that just that fact and I'm curious what's the what's the delta what's the difference in price for uh, equipment that answers that that additional need functions in all weather environments and systems and how unobtainable would that be so I might be able to respond to those criticisms where we see them. I think that our agency does a good job of balancing the equipment that we select and deploy. But on, on that point specifically, where the, the concerns of the public that a, a weather event releases may be occurring from industry in those occasions where our, our equipment simply would not function, it wouldn't gather effect, useful data, it wouldn't collect any data for us. What, is that something that we know or could we gather further information about what the additional cost might be? And I think it's a scientific question, but I'm gonna ask uh, Brandy to, to confirm for me. Sure, happy to answer that question. <clears throat> Different from our stationary or monitoring network where the sample inlets on those stations are protected um, against um, moisture or rain. Um, so they, they can continue to operate and collect data continuously through through a rainstorm. Um, and they also have um, features on, on the sampling equipment where it accounts for moisture to remove moisture from those samples as well. Um, for our mobile mon monitoring instruments, those are, those are sampling in transit and the sample inlet would, uh, the rainwater would go in there and it would damage the actual instrument um, and put that 
potentially out, out of service permanently or for some period of time. I'm not familiar with any mobile monitoring instruments that would have the capability to sample during rain. Um, that's something that we can keep our eye out for as, as we continue to look at new technologies. Um, but I, I think that's a pretty, um, pretty common scenario. Really appreciate that answer. Thank you. I'd like to add to the answer a little bit. I mean, talking about stationary monitors that, that we um, take down in anticipation of a hurricane, to my knowledge, there's no such thing as a stationary air quality monitor that's going to survive hurricane winds or, in some cases, flooding. And so, leaving those assets out in the field, we're at risk of losing those assets. And losing those assets is not only costly, but it takes a long time to replace them. And so we're, that means that we would be losing months of data that it would take for us to replace that asset if, if we could. So taking, um, taking those assets down for a period of, of days is preferable to being out the, you know, the six figures for the asset and the, the, likely months of data that it would need to replace. Um, we also have a statutory obligation to protect state resources. So that's that's why we take those those monitors down. And I would just caution that we're we're noticed for mobile monitoring equipment and devices and not stationary. So we should probably limit or go back to mobile. Fair enough. And and we'll on mobile, we deploy as as soon as it's safe for staff. Um, uh, if it's a if it's a natural disaster hurricane, obviously there's 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 damage, uh, there's critical infrastructure, there's transportation corridors, everything is in disarray and and is highly dangerous, and it, we may have regional office operations that are disrupted um, or or offline. Uh, we, staff members may be struggling with their own homes that that are flooded or damaged or even destroyed. Um, we at TCEQ pride ourselves on our mission of every day protecting human health and the environment for all Texans. And Office of Compliance and Enforcement, we're the point of the spear on that. And uh, you know, when things are at their worst, we're at our best. And even uh, when our own home is, is under, under attack, we'll still answer the call for, for our fellow Texans. And we get out there as soon as we can, but as soon as it is safe to do so. Uh, our, our greatest resource are our people, and we want to protect our people and make sure that they're safe in all circumstances. Uh, our equipment is important too, but our people are first and foremost important. Craig, I wanted to add a couple other comments also. Um, you talked about the assets that we actually own and deploy the mobile assets. I also just want to note that um, that our capabilities are, you know, go a little bit beyond that in terms of contracting for additional, um, particularly aerial surveys. And we'll, we'll uh, contract for for flyovers um, of areas of, of interest, um, uh, winged aircraft or helicopters. Um, so that, that adds to, augments our mobile monitoring capabilities, as well as our coordination with EPA in a disaster scenario where we're often working closely with them on monitoring. And they will bring some of their assets to bear, which include the, I think it's the, they call it the Aspect air, Aircraft, Fixed Wing Aircraft, and they're, I think they call it the Taga bus, which is like a mobile monitoring van. Um, so adding those capabilities to the mix for a disaster response scenario. So uh, yes, I just wanted uh, to make that note. And I'll add on, uh, you know, planning, preparation, partnerships, and people in terms of the partnerships and, and any natural disaster or emergency response scenario. We have lots of partnerships and one of our partnerships is with EPA, which which has that aerial capability as well as additional ground resources. Uh, we also have contractors on standby for those scenarios uh, that we use to deploy for air monitoring, and we use those contractors uh, primarily for hot zone deployments um, and additional augmentation for for staff. So that yeah, I, I did not mention that because it was non TCQ, but we do have that capability for emergency response that we deploy out. In most emergency response events, we'll, we'll have our contractors out there. Uh, you know, so especially if we're doing 24-7 uh, monitoring, which, which we'll often do during hurricanes, we need to have that augmented capabilities. Um, and then we'll have, you know, our partnerships with, with local entities um, and, and many even uh, uh, industrial facilities will have their own 
uh, contractors out monitoring as well. Uh, as, and so there's, there's a wide network that we draw upon with, with local authorities augmenting as well as TCEQ and federal uh, response agencies. Appreciate that. Colleagues, anything else? All right. Thanks, Thank you Greg. for your time this morning. Yeah. So Mary, I think we need to call the second we're, item. No, we're still on the same oh, item. Okay. The, these two are on, on right. the same. Feels like a different topic, but they're related. But they're related, yeah. Intertwined. Let's see. So good morning, uh, Chairman, Commissioners, uh, General Counsel. Um, I, my name is Dr. Sabina Lang, and I am the Chief Toxicologist at the TCEQ and the Director of the Toxicology Risk Assessment and Research Division. And um, so while our slides, while the, while the slides get, get switched around here, um, I'm really delighted to be here today to to talk to you about some work that we've been working on for in our in our group and in collaboration somewhat with EPA Region Six on um, developing uh, mobile monitoring comparison values. So values that we can use to interpret the um, the data that that come from these these instruments that you were just hearing about. Um, I'm joined today by uh, the section manager in the division, uh, Daryl McCant, and one of our toxicologists, Lisa Westbrook. And uh, we're kind of representing the division today, but really this is work that's been done by dozens of people over the last four years. And, and so, you know, I, I, I always have, I have the honor of presenting this, but, but really what I'm presenting is a lot of work that's been done by, by our group and in collaboration with others. So I've got um, a fair number of slides, and, and you all have some printouts of this, and they're, they're shown in the backup material. And so in the interest of time, I'm not going to go kind of painstakingly through each of them. I'm going to kind of hit the high points as, as I move through. And so there's a lot of information um, you know, that you can uh, glean from these slides as well if you're kind of looking for some details um, after, after our discussion. So I'm going to talk a bit about the um, ambient air monitoring tools and, and really the, the need for comparison values for interpreting that information and, and why averaging time is so important, why it's important that we can't use a one hour value for an instantaneous concentration. Um, I'm gonna walk you through the mobile monitoring comparison values that we've derived, give you a little bit of examples, show you some, some of the um, communication tools that we've developed and, um, and then you know, kind of wrap up. We have uh, all of the derivation documents now posted on the the toxicology webpage, so you can you can see that here. Um, if you want to to kind of get into the into the weeds of of the derivation or see the fact sheets, that sort of thing. So, um, we've we've talked uh, you know about. Craig talked about various you know, monitoring tools and, and we use different kinds of ambient air monitoring for, for different purposes at the agency. And for the many purposes that we have these monitoring uh, instruments for, we need comparison values for all of those, um, for those different tools and for those different purposes so we can interpret the data that we get out of it. Because otherwise, you know, you see a number 10 PPB well, what does that mean? Is that good? Is it bad? Is it safe? Is it unsafe? And so we need these comparison values to give that context to ourselves, to our, our staff, and um, to the general public. And so for that purpose, we derive toxicity factors. So these are, are numbers that, that indicate the potency of a chemical to, to cause um, some sort of adverse effect, and we use them to set safe levels of, of chemicals in air, water, and soil. And so um, for, for quite a long time now, we've been deriving air monitoring comparison values or AMCVs. And these are safe levels of chemicals in air and they, um, and they protect against effects um, on human health and also uh, nuisance effects like odor and um, on vegetation. And we typically derive acute comparison values for comparison to one hour or 24 hour measurements or chronic values for comparison to annual and longer than annual concentrations. And it's important to note that all of the comparison values that we derive, including all of the ones that I'm gonna talk about today, are safe levels. So these are levels at which we do not expect any health effects. And benzene is probably the best, This. Um, uh, is a, a good way to to kind of understand that that safety factor. So what you can see on the right side of the slide is what we call the the benzene thermometer, 
and it has um, it shows wrong button on a log scale also wrong button I'll stop touching remote uh, on a log scale you can see different benzene concentrations and at the very bottom of the scale is the TCQ's one hour air monitoring comparison value of 180 parts per billion and you have to get up to um, about 33,000 parts per billion before you see a mild effect in humans so that's eye irritation in humans and um, a good kind of metric to use to compare to to compare our levels which are safe to um, affect levels, EPA sets acute exposure guideline levels or AGLs, and those are set at concentrations where you might expect um, mild reversible health effects from a certain period of time of exposure. So EPA's one hour AGL one is 52,000 parts per billion. So that's a concentration where you might expect an effect. Our value is set at 180 parts per billion, and so that demonstrates the, you know, that kind of margin of of safety that we have built into our values. And so and I Dr. wanted to bring that Dr. up, Dr. Lang. I'm going to interrupt just please, for a, yeah, a please. second, just to um, for people who aren't used to looking at logarithmic scales. Yep. What what that means on this particular scale is I'm just going to call it an inch at the bottom is 10 units, yep. an inch at the top is 990 million units right so um, it's a way of presenting data <laughs> that otherwise wouldn't fit on the same line graph but um, right that that may be helpful for some people yes yeah no I appreciate that that's very true yeah and, and so yeah otherwise it would take like 10 slides of depth to uh, to to present that but yeah it really emphasizes the difference between those you know it, it's ha it's how we can put 180 and 52,000 on the same graph yeah so uh, you heard a lot about the mobile monitoring instruments. The key factor that, that I want to emphasize is that these instruments, when they're in motion, they produce what we would call instantaneous concentrations, which is really a concentration that's over, that, that is one to 30 seconds long. And um, the reason why this matters, and this, is, this has been something that we've talked about for years because it's a common misconception, is that it, you have to match the the toxicity factor, the comparison value time to the um, to the concentration measurement time. And there are two reasons for that. One is from a toxicity standpoint, the shorter time we're exposed to something, the, the higher concentration it takes to cause a negative effect. Whereas if you're exposed for a long period of time, then you only need to be exposed to a little concentration because it kind of accumulates, it, 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 it um, it accumulates damage, whereas if you're only exposed for an hour, you can tolerate much higher concentrations. So in terms of health effects, how long you're exposed matters. In terms of concentration measurements, how long that measurement is collected for also matters. And that's because air concentrations of chemicals are not homogenous. They, they go up and down even when you have a source. And so just as an example, these are one hour benzene concentrations that were measured over a one year period at one of our stationary measure monitors. And even though we have some high peaks, uh, one of the highest goes up to about 150 parts per billion. If you even just look at the 24 hour average, as opposed to the green line, which is the one hour uh, concentrations, you can see that the, the highest 24 hour average is only 11 parts per billion, because though there was just a single one hour concentration in a day that, that hit a high number. And if you look at all of the hourly measurements across the year, that average is a little less than one part per billion. So you can't assume that somebody is exposed to that one hour concentration for a whole year because we know that's not the case. And the same is true when you're looking at instantaneous data. So this is data that was collected uh, in the same spot, stationary data, over a one hour period. And you can see that the the concentrations are very peaky. Even if there's a source of, of, of chemical, there's a big difference between a one second concentration with the highest at about 830 parts per billion and the one hour concentration, which is about 85 parts per billion. The only time that, that really there's a, a comparable concentration between a very short measurement and a long measurement is when the concentrations are uniformly low. But if you have a source, then they're never just um, homogenous. So we always have to compare like to like um, short-term uh, data to short-term comparison values. Um, and so I'm going to move forward to, to the, you know, there's a lot of different uses 
for this mobile data, both while staff is in the field, as well as afterwards when we're interpreting the data and, and using it for various things. But again, you know, whenever we're using it, we need some comparison value to, to derive, to, to um, interpret that data. And the challenge for us was that um, historically, we don't have one to 30 second comparison values. And so to our knowledge, nobody does. And so what, what we had to do was to, to kind of break new ground and figure out how to derive comparison values for this type of data. And as part of that, we needed to figure out what, what we were gonna use them for. And so what the uh, mobile monitoring comparison values I'm gonna talk about are directed primarily towards our own staff so that they can use these uh, values in the field to help make decisions. And so there were two kind of primary purposes for these comparison values. One was to identify releases. So we needed a number that, that would tell us if there was a, um, some sort of a chemical release going or not. And these aren't um, tied to toxicity data because some chemicals are, are, have very little toxicity or some of them have basically no toxicity in ambient air. But if that chemical is being emitted at a thousand times or we're, we're measuring it at a thousand times higher than we normally would, probably we wanna go and find out where that's coming from and respond to that release. And, um, and so there's, there's at that aspect of it. And then the other reason that we have these comparison values is so that we can identify toxicity and say, you know, is there a problem that we need to be worried about health effects? And then of course, these are particularly useful as well for, um, for communicating the results you know, with, within the agency and, and outside of it. And so associated with that, um, we have different uh, potential actions. So, so you, it's fine to have a comparison value, but you have to know what to do when it's exceeded as well. And so we, we identified some actions and this is work that we've done together with the mobile monitoring uh, team and with the regional staff to identify actions uh, when those are exceeded, when the different levels are exceeded. And so in the next slide, I'm gonna spend some time both on the values and the actions, but it's um, important to note that, that you'll see a lot of color coding on these values and it helps us, like it, it helps me to communicate them, it helps people to understand what they are. And those, those colors are associated with the Dubas caterpillar trails. So we have four colors available to us, green, orange, red, and purple. And so you will see those colors being used throughout this presentation as well, because that helps us when we're making the caterpillar trails, we can use these comparison values to dictate when we move from green to orange and orange to red and red to purple. So it's all kind of a one cohesive unit when it comes to using these values and using them for communication. So this is um, kind of a summary slide of what these values are. What they're, what they're based on a little bit and the actions that are associated with an exceedance. So what you have is kind of the scale of increasing chemical concentration. And so at the very bottom of the scale, low concentrations, these are typical levels, you know, no problem. Just, you know, what we would normally um, measure in ambient air. And so, you know, the action associated with that is, you know, we're good, keep going. The next level is, and the next kind of, you know, as you go higher, we move into concentrations that are higher than typical levels. They're below any issues of, of toxicity concern, but now we're like, okay, this is, this is an abnormally, a normal amount of this chemical. And so that triggers source investigation. So in, in, in different ways um, that we can do that, but, but to go and look for where that chemical is coming from. The next kind of, um, uh, as you as you increase chemical concentrations, you move into kind of above what we would consider to be our, our threshold for for starting to look at toxicity for that chemical, and and so this is, and and I'll talk a bit more about it. But you know this the not health effect levels. None of these are health effect levels. But at this point, we need to start thinking about about the toxicity of that chemical and doing an evaluation. And and a good way for us to to get solid data for a tox evaluation is to get stationary data of some sort. So either um, uh, parking the van if it's safe to do so and appropriate, and collecting data in one spot so we can take the average, or taking a canister sampler, that kind of thing. As we continue to go higher uh, in terms of concentrations, then we get into this kind of this purple range, and you know the we consider for 
this this purple range to that this is where our staff need to be kind of increase their vigilance about those chemical concentrations that they're they're monitoring for to to think about you know staff safety and um and and that that kind of a change in perspective from finding out what's going on with the ambient air to you know making sure that that, that our staff are in, in a good place and then the last values are kind of a above this threshold of tox concern. And so at this point, we would talk to our staff about considering mitigating their exposure from that situation. And by mitigating exposure, I'm not talking about donning respirators or running away or anything like that. These are all levels that are below health effect levels. And so this just gives them time to think about like, okay, how would I, how would we go about doing that? Do we, or is it even appropriate? Maybe it was a short spike and we don't need to leave it all that sort of thing. So this, um, as with all of our comparison values, they're all designed to give time for actions before we would expect there to be a problem, either for our staff or for the general public. So the values that are associated, the comparison values for each of these kind of uh, markers from, from one stage to the next, the, the marker for moving into you know, source investigation is the instantaneous baseline derived investigation level, or IBEDL to the, the start of the concerns about toxicity are with the, that starts with the red value, which is the instantaneous health protective investigation level. Um, the point at which we're starting to kind of increase our vigilance is the instantaneous health-based action level, IHIBL. And then um, the last one is the exposure mitigation, health-based action levels. And primarily, we would be using a one-second value, uh, one-second comparison value for this. And as I noted before, these are all below, whoa, all below levels of, of health concern. We also have values for longer averaging times when we have that capability in the field um, and different actions associated with that. And um, although I won't get into that too much today. So our levels to identify chemical releases that that first kind of orange threshold so we're interested in in identifying abnormally high concentrations so to do that we have to first identify what's a normal concentration what would we typically be measuring in the air and so we call that the baseline and we can um, identify this baseline and, and have through a lot of surveys that our mobile monitoring groups uh, have conducted and, and understanding what kind of uh, chemical concentrations they see when there's when there's really no indication that there's any source of chemical. And it's a combination of instrument noise, because instruments always have a bit of noise, and um, and the low level concentrations of chemicals just in the environment, in the atmosphere. And so we take that baseline, and I'll show you an example of that in a figure on the next slide, and we then set the instantaneous baseline derived investigation level, or IB, to at 10 times that baseline. So this is an example of, um, of a graph showing, uh, in this case, one through butadiene concentrations that were measured in a couple of different surveys. So across the bottom, you have time. And on the y-axis is the instantaneous concentration. And this, that, that, those wiggly lines at the bottom, that's all what we would call the chemical baseline. It's just the noise from, from the instrument and, and a little bit of low-level chemical. And so we would take that multiply it by 10. And so in this example for, uh, for one through butadiene, our I beetle is 40 parts per billion. And so these baseline, um, these instantaneous baseline derived investigation levels are chemical and instrument specific. And so this is just an example of some of the I beetles for different chemicals that we're measuring in the SIFT and the DuVos. And again, when, when these are exceeded, that, that triggers source investigation. So um, I'm moving into the levels to determine toxicity. So we have a couple of these, as you've seen. Uh, the first one, the one that kind of just starts the process of thinking about toxicity is the instantaneous health protective investigation level, the red one. And um, this is set conservatively to be equal to the one hour air monitoring comparison value for that particular chemical. And so if, if a one hour, um, concentration is safe for people to breathe, then that same concentration will certainly be safe for them to breathe at if they're just if it's if it's just instantaneously, but it 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 just kind of starts us thinking, starts us down that road of thinking about toxicity. And so that would trigger some sort of stationary monitoring, canister sampling, that sort of thing, if it was appropriate to do so. 
The next level, the one that, that kind of triggers increased vigilance is the instantaneous health-based action level. This is the purple one. And it um, is set at three times higher than the, the, the red value than the instantaneous health protective investigation level. Then we move on to the um, exposure mitigation health-based action levels. We do have three of these, a uh, one-second value, a 10-minute value, and a one-hour value. And the, the purpose of having three is just to match it with the kind of averaging time concentrations that, that the staff have. And for the most part, they'll be using the instantaneous number, but um, there are circumstances where they'll have longer averaging times, and they'll be able to use those longer averaging time values as well. Again, these are not effect levels. Um, these are, 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 when these are exceeded, it just triggers kind of consideration of, of what to do, you know, if, if they want to leave the area or not, um, if they want to notify the region, that sort of thing. And so the um, instantaneous, maybe, there we go. The, so the instantaneous of the one second exposure mitigation HIBL is set at six times the one hour comparison value. So um, I'll show you uh, an example for benzene in just a moment. So you can kind of see how those all fit into the scale. So back to this kind of figure, you know, we have all of these different trigger values. So if, if we plug benzene's numbers in here, then for the I beetle, that the baseline derived value, that's 80 parts per billion. The IHIPL, the one that triggers us to start thinking about toxicity, is 180 parts per billion. The um, increased vigilance number is 540 parts per billion. And then the one second exposure mitigation value is 1,080 parts per billion. And as a reminder, again, these are levels that are, are still well below those that cause health effects. And I'll show you that in another kind of that log scale figure that, that I just that I showed you earlier. And I've already um, discussed how these same values are, are tied to the DuVos caterpillar diagram visualizations so that, that they're all kind of consistent. Um, and so we can communicate, it helps us to be able to communicate, like what does it mean if we have orange values? What does it mean if we have red values, et cetera? And so to, because there's, you know, this is a, it's a heavy topic. It's, it's a lot of, of detail and, and for this to be useful for staff in the field, we needed to, to put together some, some communication tools for them. And so we have fact sheets and decision guides uh, that we, we put together for each of the chemicals. We have a fact sheet like this one. So I'm showing you the one for benzene. Um, in the top left corner, it's got just information about benzene, what kind of health effects it can cause, et cetera. Uh, bottom left has the mobile monitoring comparison values that are specific to benzene. And then on the right side, there is a one of these thermometers, again, um, similar to the one that, that I showed you earlier, but this one has all of the mobile monitoring comparison values on it. And so you'll notice that the, the very highest of those exposure mitigation health-based action levels is a 1080 PPB. And again, the EPA's one hour acute exposure guideline level is 52,000 parts per billion. And it's still about 33 times lower than the, the lowest concentration that caused mild eye irritation in humans. So this shows you again that these aren't values at which we need to don respirators or, or, or make any kind of drastic actions, but rather, you know, let's start thinking about, about our circumstances and making sure that we're safe. Uh, one thing that we, we, we feel like it's important to always point out is that these are guide, guideline levels for staff to use. Um, they are not uh, you know, requiring that staff not leave if those concentrations are low. You know, if they're experiencing health effects or if they're concerned, they should always mitigate their exposure. They should always remove themselves from a situation they feel like is unsafe, regardless of what, what they're measuring. Dr. Lang, if I can... You go back to the last slide, and I just want to make a point about how challenging it is to communicate risk. So I think you've done a very nice job laying this out. Um, looking at the IHIPL, which is indicated in red, for benzene, it's a 180 parts per billion. Right. And that is a one-second sample. Right. Um, and it's, and correct me if I get any of this wrong, but it's derived from our air monitoring comparison value for benzene. The one hour AMCV for benzene right. is 180 parts per billion. The AMCV is a guideline that's set to be protective of um, sensitive subpopulations 
with an adequate margin of safety. Um, so if you're exposed to 180 parts per billion for an hour, you're still adequately protected. Uh, Hippel says you're only exposed for one second and yet it's rendered in red. Right. So um, it just underscores how difficult it is just to just to understand the information for the people in this room who are in this business of environmental regulation and understanding standards, mm -hmm. um, let alone trying to communicate it to, I always say my aunt, but the general public who um, has other things to do with their <laughs> day right. than to, to, you know, sit through um, long presentations on this. And that is just one of the toughest nuts to crack, um, I think, for our agency generally, definitely the field of toxicology is how do we translate these very complex concepts um, uh, in a way that is accessible for the general public? Yeah, it's a real challenge. Yeah, yeah, and that, that 180 part per billion for one hour exposure, it's protective of the general public and sensitive subpopulations with an ample margin of safety. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's already got a big protective um, component built in and then yes you add that one second in terms of the colors they're not necessarily what we would have chosen but they're what's they're the colors that were available to us for the duvas and so because we wanted to be able to coordinate all across all of them i don't i don't feel like it's a, a red uh, level of concern but it's you know because those are the colors available to us but it also like then we have to kind of make sure that you know like the number of times i've emphasized that these are these are well below health effect levels um, to make sure that we don't like people see red and they're like, oh, it's all bad, right? Yeah. No. So I'm confident that we can explain this to our um, staff who are actually in the mobile monitoring uh, vehicles or, you know, um, but, um, you know, making the, making the leap to a presentation for the general public is, a, is an extra heavy lift. But. It is, yeah, yeah, and these are, um, and these these values in general and, and these fact sheets, the 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 primary audience is for our staff to use. Um, they're not general public uh, numbers, but it is, yeah, it, it, inevitably we want to be able to use this when there's an emergency event and we post the data, yeah. right? And so then making sure that we have language and, and we have developed language to be able to say, okay, these they're above these concentrations, this is what that means, yeah. This is why we're not worried that there was a health effect. And so we also um, have other, maybe, uh, decision guides and that sort of thing to, to help folks, um, or, or folks in the field, you know, depending on, on how you like to think through these, these applications to help them figure out how to, um, you know, kind of what the next actions are if, if a particular value is exceeded. We also have comparison tables. So for the DuVos, for example, is what I'm showing here. These are chemicals that, that can be monitored or often monitored by the DuVos, the different um, applicable mobile monitoring comparison values and the actions that are associated with, uh, with an exceedance to have it kind of all in one, in one place for the staff. So I'm gonna spend just a few minutes talking through kind of um, what I would call hypothetical examples of, of how you might apply this both for a known source and um, which I'll, I'll talk um, a little bit about why we would make that distinction and an unknown source. So you could imagine having a monitoring survey uh, where you're, you're monitoring around in a neighborhood and the, um, and the monitoring device you know, shows that, that you're above um, an eye beetle, and then in this case, above an eye hippo too. You see with the orange and the red on the map, um, or what you can see on, the, um, on the, the, the data plot on the, on the right. So um, a follow-up survey might go kind of through that neighborhood as well, and confirm that in the same area, there are these higher concentrations that, that exceed our comparison values, in this case, um, above the eye beetle. And then, you know, this is, so, you know, thinking about source investigation, you know, the, the team may go down to that more highly industrialized area that was to the south of that neighborhood to see if there were any concentrations indicative of a source in that area. And, and in this case, there were, the concentrations were all low. And so then they would go back, you know, the eye hippo was triggered, it was above that kind of initial toxicity threshold. And so they could do stationary monitoring in that location if it's safe and appropriate to do so. 
uh, to, to kind of better evaluate those concentrations, both from a toxicity standpoint and then also um, as, as Director Putzoff uh, uh, discussed, the, you know, the um, using triangulation from wind and stuff like that to get an idea about sources. And so in that case, you know, we can look at both the maximum one second concentration as well as the one hour average of those concentrations to see whether or not they come above our kind of well-established toxicity factors, which in this case for benzene, they also, the, the one hour concentration stayed below our 180 part per billion comparison value. So for a known source, that's a little bit different. So, you know, the eye beetle, it triggers source investigation, but sometimes we know what the source is, right? We got called out because there was some, some leak. And so in this case, you yeah, know, we have an industrial area with a, with a residential area to the north, and the, the, um, the initial monitoring surveys confirmed that there was, you know, higher benzene, in this case, benzene concentrations in that industrial area associated with that, that source. Um, but you know, having confirmed that it's there and that, that response actions are being taken, then um, an appropriate action to take would be to relocate the monitoring instruments so that they're where the general public is being exposed. So moving out of the industrial area and into the neighborhood to see if there's any problems where the general public could be exposed. And in this case, in this example, those concentrations were all um, well below concentrations of concern. So different actions to take depending on the circumstances of the um, of the you know that, that we're dealing with with the uh, with the vans. Yeah, go ahead. How how do we answer the public on that last slide? Where I agree with you, I think that's the appropriate use of our monitor equipment. It is, I think there's <clears throat> members of the public who are who would see our repositioning of mobile assets and interpret that as we are trying to avoid observing emissions from from the source of it, it's it's a known source is that the real difference there yes we're no it longer is. Yeah. using so it, it would to be, zero in on what a right emission is yeah so this would be in, in in this case like you know we got called in because there was a, a leaking tank or something like that and so that is it's it's known it's being addressed, it's, you know, it's being fixed. And so in that case, you know, we can confirm that there were some benzene concentrations that were high in, in that proximity, but I think, and then it's, it's just down to a communication challenge. Like if, if, if you could, and, and I could see that interpretation, it's, you know, when you're presenting this information, I think it would just be important to say that, you know, this is, this was done to make sure that we were being protective of, of the general public and to see if there was more work that needed to be done to mitigate those emissions because they were, um, getting into the into the area for the general public, more aggressive actions perhaps might might need to be taken. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just just to this is you know just a summary. You know, we've derived these comparison values, um, identified potential actions associated with exceedances, developed these tools, and um, the derivation documents are now complete and they're on our webpage. That, that explain the scientific basis behind. So I've given you all these comparison values, but we actually have a substantial amount of work that we did to make sure that we were using the best available science to derive these values. So they weren't just arbitrary numbers that we picked, but there was a reason behind, there's a reason behind that three times higher value and, and all of those kinds of things. So that, that all and, and the numbers that we chose for the one hour comparison values, all of that stuff is, is documented and um, and is now up on our webpage. And I just, I did want to acknowledge again, like this is work that was done a whole bunch of people in the talks division, both current and former, um, with a lot of collaborations with the TCQ BOMA laundering team, regional staff, um, EPA region six, just a lot of people have, have spent a lot of time uh, figuring out how to develop these values. And um, I'm just so pleased to be here to, to kind of to give you this summary and to, and to tell you the, the good work that they've done. What what has EPA's role been? How, how have you coordinated or worked with them on the project? Yeah, so we've been working with them for about two years now, I'd say, and a lot of it is they've kind of served as peer reviewers for us. So we, we've done this work and we would develop it and then we would go and talk to them and, and show them some documents or give them some concepts and we would kind of talk through some things that we were having challenges with and we'd 
kind of come back and, and make modifications and we would go and for a while we were meeting on a monthly basis to to just kind of talk through the science and the concepts they gave us some of the chemicals that that we have derived um, comparison values for that they've found to be important for emergency events and so that we make sure that because we want to have kind of a big enough stock of, of chemical comparison values so that we have them ready we can we can kind of we can derive them on the fly but the more that we can have ready you know before there's a problem the better off we are so that's been kind of that interaction has there been any thought about any other form of peer review or yeah, i appreciate that this is really a tool for internal agency use mm -hmm. uh, how how we make decisions sort of what the cut points are for the advice that we give to our staff in the field um but um but I wondered if there, there, if we had contemplated any, any additional process like that. Yeah, a few years ago, we took this to um, a kind of a, a risk assessment group, and they did uh, some peer review. That was several years ago, and kind of maybe four iterations of the mobile monitoring comparison values um, ago. Uh, we have spoken to them since, but not in that kind of more formal way. But uh, we are intending as well to publish this in the peer reviewed literature. So then that will have that. You will know, we'll, we'll have that opportunity to get peer review from that perspective. Appreciate that. Yeah. Have we had any dialogue with our um, local government entities in Texas who might have monitor mobile monitor equipment that's closest to any of ours to share our experience with them and hopefully help them follow the same process? Right. Yeah, we've had a, a little bit of, of discussion with um, Harris County Pollution Control and and City of Houston. I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure it was Harris County Pollution Control with, with some of those folks about these comparison values so that they might be interested in, um, in applying it. They have, uh, um, it's called the MAML van. I think it's Mobile Air Monitoring Laboratory. Uh, that they use, and so we have we have discussed it with some of them. We haven't done kind of a big outreach to local governments. That that sort of expertise typically isn't out there. But but really, like we're happy to communicate this stuff with with whoever needs it, both us and together with monitoring division to help with their expertise. Uh, there's a group at Texas A&M who has a mobile instrument. It's a different kind than ours, although we're we're familiar with the technology, and we've actually had monitoring surveys where we've we've gone out with them, and and I've discussed these values with them, and, and you know hoping that they would be useful, or even sometimes it's just the concepts that they the concepts would be useful for others to to kind of apply when they're thinking about their data as well. Yep. Um, I guess the only thing I'll, that I'll add is other states are interested in this. Dr. Lang made a similar presentation to the Environmental Council of States uh, at a recent conference here in Austin, and it was well attended, and, and there seemed to be a lot of interest um, because other states are, are uh, some more than others, but they are buying mobile monitoring assets and facing the same challenges that we are, which is how do we make sense out of these, these one-second data points? Right. But, Yep. All right. Anything else? Thank you, Dr. Lang. Thank Appreciate you so much it. for your time. Um, all right, Mary, I think we're now ready for item two. Yes. How about, how about we take a five minute recess? Okay. Um, it's 1038 and we'll be, we'll be back in now 1039. Let's say, well, let's say, let's return to 1045. We're in recess. We got one.
This is for you. All right, it's 10:49. We are back from recess. Mary, please call item two. Item two is our discussion of the Supplemental Environmental Projects Program. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel. My name is Keith Angeliadov. I'm the Deputy Director of the Litigation Division, and I'm here today to talk about Supplemental Environmental Projects, or as we like to call them, SEPs. And because today's presentation is going to be put on by the Litigation Division SEP team who are in front of you, I'd like to begin by introducing them to you. So closest to me is Carlos Flores, and he's the newest member of the SEP team. He's been with the program for about a year, and he's a SEP coordinator in the El Paso region. So I'm particularly excited to see him in person today. <laughs> um, Carlos works on drafting and negotiating respondent SEPs, and these are mostly custom and compliance SEPs. Next to Carlos is Adina Kreider, and she's a SEP work leader. She oversees the program, and she ensures compliance with the pre-approved SEPs. So she makes sure that the contributions to those SEPs are used in accordance with those agreements. Next to Adina is Barrett Hollingsworth. She drafts the SEP agreements, the third-party SEP agreements that lead to those pre-approved SEPs. And she also answers all the legal questions about the SEP program. To give you a roadmap of today's presentation, we're going to start with a, oh, I forgot. There are, there are also other people that are going to be um, helping us with some questions. So there's uh, Jess Robinson, who's the senior attorney in this table right here. And then on the other side at that table is um, Melissa Cordell and Amy Sedemeyer. And that's because the vast majority of agreed orders that have SEPs are negotiated in the enforcement division. So an overview of the program is we're going to start with um, a brief discussion of the SEP program. Then we're going to concentrate on third-party administrators and pre-approved SEPs. And then we're going to finish up with a list of ideas on how to increase participation in the program. And this last topic arises from the last work session that we had on SEPs um, from March of 2022. And that's because while this is a wonderful program, it's entirely voluntary. And so the percentage of agreed orders that contain SEPs is between 10 and 20 percent. And so you asked us to brainstorm ideas on how to increase participation. So we spent the time brainstorming with the enforcement division, and we have a list of ideas to talk about. The I and the thought is that they could be implemented at a later date. Some of these ideas will require changes to written policy. Um, and so with that in mind, the PowerPoint that you're going to see today, some of the slides say SEP statute on them, and that's to indicate the parameters come from statute. Other slides have SEP policy on them, and that's to indicate that the parameters come from SEP policy. And so you have a little more discretion to change those if you want to. And so if there are no questions, I'm going to turn it over to the SEP team. Questions? See none. Thanks. Nice. Carlos, if you like, we could make this a little bit less formal and you could stay at the table. Uh, no. Suggestion? Comfortable <laughs> no. up there? All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, like, I prefer you up there then. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm Carlos Flores, the sub specialist with the litigation division. Um, so I'm just going to give, like I said, a brief overview of the program and our contribution pre approved SEPs. Um, so, what is a SEP? A SEP is an environmental enhancement project that offsets a respondent's administrative penalty in a TCEQ enforcement matter. Um, as Katanjali stated, this is voluntary and optional in order to settle enforcement cases. Um, it is found within the SEP stat the SEP statute is found within Texas Water Code 7.067. Uh, below is a link to our website that contains our applications, the SEP statute, guidance, uh, other information about our program, as well as our contact information. <laughs> So what is the purpose of a SEP? 
The SEP statute states that it is to prevent pollution, reduce the amount of pollutants reaching the environment, enhance the quality of the environment, and contribute to public awareness of environmental matters. Um, SEP location. The SEP statute also says that uh, it should give preference to benefit the community in which the alleged violation occurred. Um, community is not defined within the SEP statute. So through policy, we've uh, created uh, community examples such as uh, city, county, Texas River Basin, Texas Aquifer, and Texas Air Control Region, just to name a few. Um, so there are three types of SEPs. Custom SEP, which any respondent can perform. Contribution to a pre-approved SEP, which again, any respondent can perform. These are created through the SEP policy. And compliance SEP, only gov local government respondents can perform, and that is uh, from the SEP statute. Uh, so SEP media. Air SEPs are performed with penalty monies from air violations and water and waste SEPs are grouped together and those can be performed with penalty monies from water and waste violations. Uh, SEP offset. All SEPs are funded by TCEQ penalties assessed against the respondent. Uh, allowable offset, offset does not reduce the total penalty that a respondent owes and it's determined by the type of respondent and environmental benefit. A respondent can choose to contribute the amount to a pre-approved SEP or perform a custom SEP or compliance SEP expending at least the SEP offset amount. Um, so as stated earlier, the penalty percentage offset is determined by the type of respondent and environmental benefit. Uh, in terms of the type of respondent, governmental entities or nonprofits have an allowable offset of 100%, while for-profit corporations or individuals have an allowable offset of 50%. Uh, in terms of environmental benefit, uh, we'll discuss a little bit later in the presentation uh, this uh, image here and uh, more information about it. Uh, but just to note that there's three types, direct, indirect, and mixed, and currently the SEP program only has direct projects. Um, so what are the options for respondents? Um, so for-profit, again, they have 50% offset, and non-profit, who have 100% offset, uh, they can perform a contribution SEP, which uh, they're allowed to uh, <laughs> contribute to a pre-approved SEP uh, by a third party, or a custom SEP, which is uh, designs and performs a SEP within their community. A local government has 100% SEP offset, and they can do a contribution SEP or a custom SEP, uh, but as stated earlier, through SEP statute, they can also do a compliance SEP, which allows them to do a project that brings it into compliance with environmental laws or remediate harm uh, caused by the alleged violation. Um, so that covers the brief overview, and now I'm going to discuss a little bit about the contribution to pre-approved SEPs and the third-party administrators. Um, so a contribution to a pre-approved SEP. A uh, respondent can choose to contribute their uh, payable SEP offset amount to a third-party administrator that has an existing SEP agreement uh, with TCEQ to perform a SEP. Uh, these are limited to a pre-approved SEP in the respondent's community that matches the respondent's violation media, as I stated earlier, uh, benefit to the community and the media. Uh, pre-approved SEPs cannot benefit the respondent and must be approved by the commission before a contribution can occur. Uh, to the right, you'll see an image of our website. Um, if you follow that link, it'll show you our project administrators and title. If you click on all those specific links, you can see the description of the certain project that you select. It also shows you the funding status of each project. And um, we have a nifty little search engine there and you can filter it by county or by media. Uh, so what's a third party administrator? Uh, Pre-approved SEPs are performed by third party administrators that have an agreement with TCEQ to receive contributions from respondents to perform environmental enhancement project. Uh, third party administrators are only governmental organizations and or nonprofit organizations, and they must fulfill certain requirements such as being able to receive and manage SEP funds in a separate bank account, providing a line item budget, and comply with reporting. Uh, here we have an example of one of our third party administrators of project. Uh, it was a new dock for conservation activities at Green Island. Um, so just to give you some examples of the pre-approved steps that we have, uh, for air, we have uh, school bus replacement, energy efficiency upgrades, establishing air monitoring networks. Uh, for water and waste, we have collection events, habitat restoration, uh, cleanup events, uh, establishing water and monitoring networks, and public water systems assistance projects. Um, here's another example of one of the projects that we have. It was a household hazardous waste collection event. Um, you can see great work by the community. Uh, allowable third-party administrator SIP uh, expenses. So we have direct costs of the project, which includes supplies, materials, equipment, and contracted labor, including engineering. Uh, there's also discretionary administrative costs. Uh, these are limited to nonprofits and local governments as defined in the statute. Uh, 
Um, it cannot exceed 10% of the direct cost of the project. And this can include salary, fringe benefits, travel, per diem, and overhead costs. Um, here we have some more example of our set projects. Uh, one of them is the, at the bottom is the Gulf Coast Authority's Trash Bash. Uh, above you'll see kind of a unique project. It was the purchase of a vehicle for free emissions checks in the Corpus Christi area. Um, so to any third party administrators watching, um, if you are looking to get potential funding for a project or you have big ideas to help extend the SEP program, reach, uh, reach out to us. Uh, below we have our link to our application. Um, there's also our contact information, SEP reports at tcq.texas.gov. Um, we're more than happy to walk you through the application process, what happens before and after the application. And if you want to just discuss any project ideas with us that you might have, uh, go ahead and reach out to us so we can do projects like the one seen below, which is a assistance uh, project for the city of Hamilton with their public water. Uh, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Adina, who's going to cover the next topic in the presentation. Well, Carlos saved us some time. <laughs> we were a little worried about the time. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you, Carlos. Um, do you guys have any questions before I jump into the next topic? Seeing none. Thank Great. You. So at the last work session, we were tasked with brainstorming some ideas, like Gitanjali already mentioned, and we were pretty excited to get to do that because we would like to make our program more efficient and streamline processes, but also, you know, benefit the community as much as we can. Um, so some of the ideas that we have, we'll get to in just a second. But first, I would like to give you some updated metrics on what our program currently looks like participation-wise. <clears throat> so the table on the right of the slide is very similar to the table that I presented at the last work session, just updated for the last fiscal years, or last five fiscal years. Um, for your reference, all of the metrics in this PowerPoint will be from fiscal year 2020 to May 1st of 2024, so mostly present. Um, as you can see on the left, uh, like Atanjali mentioned earlier, most of our cases containing SEPs is averaged between 13 to 14% up until this fiscal year. We've seen an increase in um, respondents, specifically local governments, doing more compliant SEPs. Um, you have also see on the left uh, the average percent of assessed penalties at SEP offset amount. Let me say that again. The average uh, SEP offset amount from assessed penalties has been about 20 to 24 percent. And uh, this current fiscal year, we're sitting at 49 percent of assessed penalties going to SEPs. But that is because of one outlier that was a $2 million compliance SEP project. Uh, which we're pretty sure that community really appreciated the work going back to resolve those violations. Um, if our uh, current processed SEP attachment A's get um, through the system this fiscal year, our projected numbers for fiscal year 2024 should be on track with to maintain those percentages. So now the, uh, the fun part, the ideas. Uh, our first uh, idea is like, how can we outreach more? Um, how can we reach these communities that don't have as much set participation? Uh, how can we promote success stories online? Um, how can we get some feedback from the public on what they would like to see in their community? Um, can we eliminate some certain policy restrictions that may have made sense at the time when they were written, but maybe not so relevant today? Um, can we streamline negotiations with respondents to make the process more efficient? And can we incentivize respondents to maybe participate more? So more than just that 14% of cases will, you know, more steps will have, more cases will have steps. Thank you. Um, so we had this map created of our current third party administrators to show where the distribution is that they currently operate. And you can see in this map, it's kind of disproportionate. The darker colors, there's more third-party administrators in those areas. The white slash light purple color is honestly just our statewide options right now. There's no local specific third-party administrators in those areas. You can see that um, a predominant number of our third-party administrators are along the coastal regions. Do you have any questions about this? Cool. 
So our average third party num uh, administrators by region are predominantly in the Houston region, Beaumont region, and Corpus Christi, like we just talked about, the co coastal regions. But you can see there's a vast majority of regions out there that only have one to none. This bar graph is not including those statewide options. Um, so when penalty dollars go back into those communities, there's a better chance that they're going somewhere else in the state, maybe not necessarily directly back into that region where those dollars were coming from. So we'd like to increase participation in those areas. <clears throat> I intend to show with this slide that there is a correlation between the number of third-party administrators that we have in specific regions, the SEP offset amounts in those regions, and the lack, I mean, the to <sighs> sorry, got lost for a second. The lack of agreed orders in those regions. Nope, that's not what I'm trying to say. Forgive me. That okay. makes sense though, doesn't it? I mean, in some regions, like certainly on the ship channel, you're gonna have a lot more agreed orders than you are out in some unpopulated region in West Texas, let's say, right? Right, maybe I should just stop so looking fewer, at my notes. There are fewer SEP, fewer SEP, dollars that are going to be available in some parts of the state but yeah sorry to interrupt you no i appreciate it you put me right back on track so that gray line there is the total agreed orders that are issued for those last five fiscal years um, that's containing sets and not containing sets just total agreed orders issued the orange line specifically are the ones containing sets and then the blue line is i mean the blue bar graph are the sep offset amounts for those regions <clears throat> I'm gonna go back one slide. Um, region four here, I mean, Houston, Beaumont, and Corpus Christi are, are pretty big regions, like you just said, with the ship channel, more agreed orders. Uh, Dallas-Fort Worth has also got a lot of agreed orders, but we only have one third-party administrator in there, so you would think, because they have a lot of agreed orders, they probably do a lot of SEPs. They actually don't. There are 800 agreed orders that came out of that region in the last five years, but only 30 headsets. Isn't that crazy? So there is a direct correlation. Yeah, potential. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, we did reach out to some of our third party administrators before this work session and kind of asked them for some feedback on just the overview of the overall state of the program and if they had some suggestions for us on how we could promote outreach. And we heard back from a few of them that they recommend we we come and give some presentations at their associations or conferences that they put on, um, uh, like Texas Rural Water Association or TWIC, the Texas Water Infrastructure Coordination Committee. Um, the Texas Rural Municipal League is on our radar, just some other um, conferences so we can promote our program so that if there are local governments or nonprofits who attend those meetings, they'll be aware of our program and maybe be interested in trying to get some of these penalty dollars into their communities. <clears throat> um, another thing that they asked was if there was a way that we could post how-to videos of our application online. And so we reached out to media relations and came up with some ideas with that in mind of how can we utilize this culture of social media to promote our program. And, uh, you know, success videos came up, um, how-to videos, uh, PSAs, blogs, and we are working currently with Media Relations on an article um, to promote our program. Um, media Relations is super excited about these ideas and are totally on board with helping us implement some of these changes. Uh, another idea that we were brainstorming is this idea of a suggestions box on our website, just a, a box for members of the public to put ideas out of things that they would like to see in their community that we could review and vet and then post in a manner that local governments or nonprofits could look, la look at and see if, well, does this fit with their mission? Is this something they could take on? Oh, maybe that's exactly in their community and something they've been dreaming about so they could apply to do that specific project. Um, that is actually pretty much all I have. 
So I'm going to pass this off to Barrett unless you have specific questions on those things. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Ooh. My name is Barrett Hollingsworth. I'm the attorney for the SET program. I'm so happy to be here today and I get to present to you on something very fun, which is the official SEP guidance publication. Um, so this is a commission approved document that was has not been edited formally since 2015. So it's due for some upgrades um, and we've identified some policies within this document that are not required by statute and not even really founded in statute that may be limiting the amount of participation among third party administrators and respondents to TCEQ enforcement actions. So I'm gonna propose three changes which relate to eliminating some of these restrictions that are, have become a little bit outdated over time. The first of which is about removing the offset lim percentage limitation that Carlos talked about earlier where local governments and nonprofit entities are allowed to offset 100% of their penalty towards a step, um, but for-profit entities and individuals, which contribute the vast majority of dollars towards pre-approved SEPs, are only allowed to offset 50% of their penalty. So what this means is that if a for-profit entity has a $400,000 penalty, they're only allowed to give 200,000 of that towards a SEP, and the other $200,000 has to go to general revenue. So I've got a chart here, thanks to Adina, um, that shows you a hypothetical of what the last five years would have looked like if this policy restriction had not been in place. So the green or the, the blue bars are what actually happened in terms of the payable penalty to general revenue and the SEP offset from penalties. Um, but that orange bar shows uh, that over $8.5 million could have gone to our pre-approved SEPs uh, SEPs had we not had this restriction in place. And 8.5 million would have gone a long way towards funding our third party administrators projects. So next I'm going to talk to you about um, media type limitations. So right now, and this is not in SEP statute, uh, contrary to popular belief, this is actually only in our policy. Are, are the only thing the SEP statute says about the relationship between the violation and the SEP that is performed is that it has to benefit the community in which the violation occurred. It doesn't say anything about media. So right now, air, air dollars all go to air SEPs and water and waste SEPs. Can all, do, penalty dollars can only go to water and waste SEPs. Um, you can see another handy chart right there um, that the vast majority of penalty dollars that are going to SEPs are going to air SEPs. Um, that's that dark blue, those dark blue bars right there. $7.8 million went to pre-approved air SEPs, but only $1.5 million went to pre-approved water and waste SEPs. Um, you can see the $7.4 million number there, which looks impressive, but that relates to compliance SEPs and our third party administrators um, aren't involved in that process. So really our air third party administrators are getting a lot more funding. So here's just a, some more pictures, which are nice um, as an example of what a water and waste set could look like. Um, sometimes these are really large scale projects that have a really big budget. If you go on our pre-approved SEP web page, then you'll see some water waste projects that have like a $4 million or $5 million budget and they've barely got anything in there. Um, this is uh, from Galveston Bay Foundation's Marsh Mania Restoration Program, um, which shows before and after pictures of a restoration project. And the last third topic that I wanted to talk to you about in the SEP guidance document is our direct, indirect, mixed project offset limitation. Carlos touched on this earlier, but we categorize our SEPs by the amount of benefit that they have towards the environment. So indirect benefit SEPs would be potentially educational SEPs, for example, or licensing. Um, they would not directly go out and benefit the environment. Mixed benefit SEPs would include both direct and indirect components. And direct benefit SEPs include a direct uh, going out onto the field benefit to the environment. However, the SEP statute doesn't actually contemplate 
that we give the preferential treatment to direct benefit SEPs that we do. Um, one of the purposes of SEP, the SEP program is to um, contribute to public awareness of environmental matters. Um, so this, this restriction here, as Carlos mentioned, we don't have any mixed or indirect benefit SEPs right now. And it's difficult to say how many we would have had because a lot of third party administrators effectively get spooked when they realize they're not going to get as much money if they're doing a indirect or mixed benefit project. Um, picture on the lower right is just a cute example of what an educational SEP could look like. This was not funded using SEP dollars, but was performed in association with Texas A&M Corpus Christi's auto check SEP. And next, um, especially for implementing changes that might lead to more participation in the program and in a general interest in settling cases efficiently, um, we have an idea to streamline the negotiations of cases that involve SEPs. So we have right here a checkbox. Um, this is an example of what an agreed order could look like if we implemented this. It would remove the requirement for applications to these SEPs. Um, but just include this within the body of the agreed order itself. Uh, the current process is somewhat lengthy. The respondent would receive an initial proposed agreed order without the SEP information included. It would only be in the cover letter um, where they can go get more information on SEPs. But what we're contemplating is eliminating that um, application altogether, which would shave off several weeks of the process and instead just presenting everything that the respondent would be eligible to contribute to within the body of the agreed order. They'd just be able to check that little box right there and then um, check whichever option they would be interested in giving to. Finally, our most fun option is the potential of providing an, an extra incentive um, to respondents based on their willingness to contribute to a SEP. Surprisingly, this is definitely authorized by the SEP, SEP statute, um, which y'all have the authority to reduce a respondent's payable penalty based on their willingness to contribute. Um, it's difficult to say by how much this would increase participation, uh, but it, I feel confident that it would. Um, the SEP statute says that the commission may compromise, modify, or remit with or without conditions an administrative penalty um, imposed on the, the subchapter based on SEP participation. Um, this would require several considerations to put into place. It would be more difficult to put in place to, than the last few ideas that we suggested. Um, we would need to think about eligibility criteria. Should findings orders be eligible? Should compliance and custom SEPs also be eligible? And then we'd need to think about the amount of the penalty reduction or deferral. Um, we've been throwing around the amount 5% just to kind of wrap our heads around the option of what this would look like. Um, but in reality, um, the people who work on the penalty policy would need to come up with a number that would incentivize set participation while maintaining an adequate deterrent effect. And with that, we've finished up. Here's our contact information. Great, thank you. Colleagues, questions or comments? I just want to say I really appreciate that look at the policies. I'm one of those people that's always like, why why do we have this? And if there's not a reason for it or a real requirement, I'm usually in favor of eliminating that. Um, I might be in the minority here, but I view it a little bit differently. I mean, I appreciate the policy suggestions and I hate to be a wet blanket. Um, I, I, um, this is a really important authority that we have, this statutory authority. This program does an incredible amount of good in our communities. So for me, the, the watchword is judicious. Let's be really judicious about how we implement the program so we don't give the legislature a reason to take it away from us. Um, and so um, I'm more amenable to some of these policy uh, um, recommendations than, than others. Um, <clears throat> for example, the idea that we would, um, what was the first one? 
the first one related to um, the distinction between nonprofit and governmental entities and for-profit entities and individuals. Right. That feels like it could be a dramatic change that would, you know, and it, which is probably why you went there. You know, let's have some real, some real change. And I'm, I'm certain I'll get some disagreement from my colleagues here. But um, when it comes to the SEP program, because it is very dear to me, you know, I would want to move slowly and incrementally and make sure that we have clarity vis-a-vis -vis the legislature so we don't um, so we don't jeopardize the, the statutory authority that we have. Um, now the the one that I'm, I'm a little bit more warm on is the idea of, of crossing over media types. So um, just a personal prejudice, I'm, I'm much more interested in the direct environmental benefits that that feels more tangible to me you know let's give a drinking water system the assets it needs to make sure that its customers are drinking safe water um, i i appreciate and understand the value of of education but those you know the sort of direct um, environmental performance benefits in my mind are a little bit um, more more urgent and important and valuable than the indirect um, but with respect to changing across media types, you know, using um, a SEP from an air violation to fund in the same community a project to improve a wastewater system or a drinking water system, that one I could probably get on board with because there's um, incredible need on water infrastructure, for example. Um, and in some communities, there is quite a bit of need in terms of um, um, projects to improve air quality. So it could go the other way also. Um, so that's my wet blanket. Let's move slowly, yeah. cautiously, cool. judiciously, and, and, and um, yeah. try, to, try to maintain and protect the authority that we have. I, I really appreciate hearing both those thoughts. I'm, and I'd like to hear a little more from Commissioner Gonzalez as well, but I, I think the, Initial reflections. I share your some of your caution, uh, Chairman, uh, on the switch removing the fifty percent limitation. That that to me seems like such an easy, obvious yes, absolutely. Let's remove that gate, especially when it's something that we imposed ourselves that our agency decided not to uh, not to move too far too fast. Uh, the the net aggregate impact, $8 million change, that's, that's not nothing. And I think that checking with our appropriators, checking with the legislature downtown, making sure that the, the governor's office is well aware of how that revenue impact could really truly reflect the state in a, in a very meaningful degree, we need to be very cautious about how tweaking some of these levers that we have access to and control over doesn't inadvertently cross over into another area of the state's work. I, I think the removal of the media bucket prohibition opens up some real exciting possibilities. Seeing that chart where so much of the money has come in from air permit matters, but I think there's tremendous need in the water wastewater space at removing that prohibition and looking to see if some of the uptake of our set participation flourishes elsewhere in the state where, where I think there is some real unmet need. I would be very excited to see us explore that. And as far as the last the last item you raised, the, the suggestion of ratcheting back, offering some discount on our penalties, um, I'm grateful that y'all have explored that that far in looking at what all options are on the table. I think that's that's a bit too far for us to entertain that that level of changing. I don't want to incentivize unduly uh, and, and put Exactly to your point, Chairman, I don't want to have a very useful tool that exists right now in our toolbox placed away or behind lock and guard or with an extra set of, of scrutiny. Uh, but that brings me to the the middle one. And Chairman, you didn't mention anything about this one. And that's the checkbox thing. Oh, now we're now we're talking. Let's let's tweak policy or the process. Having our respondents receive going through this torturous black box arduous process and they see a letter. Oh, I've got a settlement here. Okay, there's a SEP thing, that's fine. I've got to apply to it. Ah, never mind. Having instead a checkbox 
well, I like I like SEP. I'm thinking of filing my taxes in that that presidential uh, process. That's that's a very abstract and removed policy good that we make it far easier for those respondents to consider. And I would love to see us really consider what that path would look like and see if you have any concerns there. I'd love to address those concerns because I think there's some exciting possibility there. Simply us polishing our process to get the heck out of the way and where our procedure our policies currently allow but i think we make it a little bit slower in just the bounce back and forth process but um, i'm curious what you think about that one commissioner gonzalez what do you think i i just i have a question i guess for for the group there did i understand correctly that these things these changes that you're recommending we already have the statutory authority correct so these are just these are extra things that we have kind of imposed that have like maybe made the program a little less effective than it could be. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I I would definitely support some changes and I recognize the um, need to be judicious about it, but you know, updating it and after 10 years is probably, probably I think a good, good idea. Fair enough. <laughs> um, about the checkbox, I mean, the other thing to consider is we're saving agency resources as as well. It's not just making life easier on respondents, it's making it easier on agency personnel. And I'm all about that in an environment where um, our resources have been, you know, somewhat, um, they haven't kept pace with the demands on this agency by a long shot, let's just put it that way. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm I'm very interested in that idea as well. And I I think that what you were talking about with the public water systems too is is a really yeah. good idea just because there is such a tremendous need there and we see that time and time again. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be I think fantastic. I'm going to suggest something a little different that may not sound real judicious. I think it is. Um and I'm not sure maybe there's precedent for it, but um thinking about El Paso and thinking about our border region um, I believe somewhere in the water code, the agency has authority to spend dollars um, across the border where they have where we have environmental benefits in in Texas. And I'm sure your pollution prevention dollar um, could have much greater benefits for El Pasoans if it's spent in Juarez on the right project um, than one spent in in El Paso. So um, I know that's a kind of a complicated challenge, but um, but I, but we may want to consider that. Um, do do y'all know if there's any precedent for that? I, I understand like in ancient lore, we have spent money internationally before, but I think, um, yes. but I don't know if that was a set. We, we actually did have a SEP with the University of Texas uh, LBJ that was a inter, what do we call it? A transboundary SEP. Um, okay. So it was in Mexico and Texas. Um, there is a portion of our statute that does authorize that. Okay. Um, we are also working with another, developing another transboundary SEP right now. Okay. okay. Great. Some of these revisions would really help them. <laughs> okay. Understand. <laughs> especially the media one that you mentioned that can be a complicating factor for negotiating a lot of third-party admin uh, administrator agreements is is this an air agreement is this water both well it sounds like we're kind of all somewhat warmed up the idea of, of changing the policy on that we do have some metrics if you're interested on the appropriations comment that you made oh yes mostly just to put things in um some perspective with the biennial budget being 115 billion with our penalties running off to the great void of general revenue um 8 million would be less than 0.01 percent of that that is reassuring uh, i think i'm always surprised to find where even the smallest dollars and pennies sometimes catch catch the attention of our elected officials downtown during during the legislative session but I think the uh, just that potential impact in changing some of the internal gates really does excite me. Having uh, a media project start and where where the data that you show the graphic where there's a, a real scarcity of third-party administrators today, I know some of those cities 
in some of those regions that currently have zero or one third party administrators, I'm, I'm sure those city governments would be thrilled to jump on a uh, copy the the SEP that got approved for their sister city across our state and immediately on a very short notice, give you all some work to review and, and have a project. So I think a little attention on this front, uh, reminding some of the parts of our state where they're standing to miss out on our agency's good work on enforcement and in, in their their local nonprofit activities or, or potential the, the the suggestion box on give us an idea for a step. I really like that idea where I think our agency staff, I'm I'm reluctant to have too much uh, of a relationship between particular set projects and, and our agency pe people in our agency, but we may have ideas where our agency uh, our agency personnel are engaged directly with a need that they can't easily put their name in the suggestion box. But being able to point to that set page where y'all are giving the how to video on how to go about applying that's very easy for our staff as they engage with the the citizen who has a very clear need. And they're aware of a, a nonprofit partner in the in the community there. So appreciate all this work. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Commissioner, because uh, we actually heard about TWIC through our drinking water program, and they connected us to present at their meeting already. And we have heard from two nonprofits actually in West Texas because of that. That's really exciting. Thank you. How else can we help you promote the program? What can we do? <laughs> uh, to bring it back to the feedback that we got from our third party administrators, one thing that they expressed difficulty with um, was connecting with the regulated community. Um, as third party administrators themselves, they're allowed to advertise themselves to people who are subject to TCQ enforcement actions. But if y'all have any thoughts on how they could do that, that would be appreciated. Yeah, some of our nonprofits are more focused to like a specific county, and they're not as familiar with the regulated community as a Houston Regional Monitoring Corporation is. And um, so they're not as familiar also with our process. So the best we do right now is direct them to our pending enforcement cases on our public website and allow them to search by county and kind of walk them through finding respondents in their area. Um, but then you're kind of soliciting. Then they're just cold calling. Yes. And it's, that, that can be an odd conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we might, in order to forestall the likely outcome that every every bright nonprofit in our, our state would want to try to get a contact list of every one of our regulated entities and start mailing them out. Uh, Maybe we can work with our, uh, our our colleagues and counterparts we interact with in the different state associations who represent many of the regulated entities and might suggest that those associations connect with y'all in terms of trying to help. Yeah, that would be great. We would be the, happy to. If, if they prefer their members just have have their contact lists shared with y'all and our, our nonprofits that reach out may be able to then go mail out to that list or perhaps they want to invite some of the nonprofits to come speak with some of their members along with y'all at future future meetings. Just trying to brainstorm here. Thanks. Other comments, questions? Um, I think, you know, what I... I think we have a comment here from our staff. Oh. Uh, Amy. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioner, General Counsel. For the record, I'm Amy Sedemeyer of the Enforcement Division. Um, just wanted to build on your comment, uh, Commissioner Janeka. I think that's it from our perspective within the Enforcement Division. I think that would be in immensely helpful because what we find is respondents don't understand the program. And so we do our best to explain it to them. But if they have that repetition of explanation of the program um, from multiple areas, it would be, I think we would see an increase in participation as well um, across the board. Um, so definitely appreciate that recommendation. I think we would, we would appreciate that as well. Um, if y'all will indulge me one second, I'd like to introduce the staff that we have with us today. Um, so of course, y'all know M Melissa Cordell, um, Michael Parrish, um, I have Stephen Hall, he's my drinking water, one of my drinking water team leaders. Um, Krista Clement is my division programs section manager. 
Um, I also have Megan Crinklaw, who is one of our newer enforcement coordinators in the water quality section. Um, Desmond Martin is one of our air enforcement coordinators and Rajesh Achara, I cannot pronounce his last name, I apologize Rajesh. Um, he is one of our air enforcement coordinators as well. So we were wanting them to come and, and listen to the discussion. Um, so thank you for the time. Um, one final just clarifying point on the checkbox um, consideration that would reduce time for us. Um, yeah. That if we had that ability to just present an initial order that had those options listed for the respondent, um, not only would it be more efficient for the respondent, it would certainly eliminate time spent preparing a revised order and going through that review process and then waiting for the signature on that revised order. So we are fully That's on board with that if you guys are very compelling are argument that. for me so. is saving staff time. Yeah, but to me, I mean that that makes it so much simpler for the the people with the with the order because they're just instead of educating all those people on on SEPs and and how to do an application and stuff, you're you're just simplifying that with just this little checkbox process. So I, I think that makes sense. Thanks for that, Amy. Appreciate it. Uh, in the spirit of brainstorming, uh, Amy said something that popped an idea in my head, and uh, it's something that we haven't actually done. We've given trainings internally, and we've done these work sessions, but maybe we should do a video not just on how our third-party administrators apply, but for respondents about the program, so they have a better understanding of what this program is and how they can utilize it, especially for our local governments who don't understand compliance steps and how they can actually resolve their violations and offset their penalty with those steps, um, and just explain the contribution step portion a little more. I like that idea. Yeah, and the you know the local governments they have their own associations. You know, we've got Texas Municipal League, Texas Association of Counties, like pushing that out for them. Probably be really effective, I think, in getting their participation. I love that suggestion, Adina. I think those are the two biggest persistent needs that y'all would have. That a video would simplify and save you the time of ex explaining to members of the public the would be SEP applicants but also the participants of the SEP program, the respondents themselves. Very good suggestion. All right, what else? I feel like we're nearing the end. So given the discussion and about potentially changing the policy, I guess the next step, just to, to throw that out there, I think would be to propose specific changes so that y'all could see what that might look like in written form. And so that we could have another meeting, either another work session or a topic at an agenda where you could deliberate on the specific language or specifically what that policy would look like and give the public the opportunity to comment on that as well. Why don't we do that? Colleagues? All right. Sounds like a plan. Um, don't, don't let my wet blanket prevent you from putting things in that, but just understand that when I see them, I may pull out my wet blanket. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. I will mention that these some of these policies are not 10 years old, but are roughly my age. So yeah. um, <laughs> at the very least, we might reconsider their purpose. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, we might have to do some historical work to figure out what the original intent was. Um, Colleagues, any other direction that you'd like to give staff as they're putting pen to paper on a on a revised policy? All right, I think we have marching orders and a and a plan. Yes. Anything else? All right. Let's get some cool equipment. Yeah. Um, one o'clock at at the campus, our second public meeting of the day to go look at our air monitoring toys. Um, Mary, what else do we have? Oh, I have additional items. We do. We do I have, have one more um, additional items on the work session agenda. Um, items three through six were for closed session, but we the I commission won't them. be meeting in closed session today, so we're done with those. <laughs> Go ahead, Adina. Can I ask one more? Yes. Okay. I I did think of a need that you could maybe help us with. Um, we are operating out of an access database. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. So we're yeah, make you say it twice. We're okay. We are currently operating out of a Microsoft Access database. 
which is outdated and um, it slows us down a bit. Uh, so we have presented a, we have submitted a ticket with ITWG. We actually had it ranked last fiscal, the fiscal year before, um, but because of a sunset in the legislative session, we got bumped. Um, so we are presenting another ITWG ticket this year, and we were kind of hoping to have your backing behind that. <laughs> I appreciate you elevating the profile. Of that, that was very yeah. Yeah. well played. <laughs> all right, I think we're done. Can I? Can I? All right. So um, the time is eleven thirty-nine. Thank you all very much. We are adjourned. <laughs>